ransom captive Israel. That mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O Come, thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadows pour to flight. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, good and morning. welcome to Trinity. We are so excited to have you here this morning on this first Sunday of Advent. Advent is our season of preparation as we look forward to the birth of Jesus Christ. We build each week, focusing on a word, and our word this Sunday is hope. And we're going to dig into what biblical hope looks like. But these are not just sentimental words that adorn our Christmas decorations. These are words that we depend on. These are words that we need. These are words that we can sink our teeth into that, that get us up in the morning, that keep us going through difficult days. And so you're invited to come. Whether you are joining us in person, joining us online, come and join into this worship as we expectantly look forward to the birth of Christ the King. So I invite you to stand and join in our call to worship this morning. And our call to worship is our first opportunity each week to unite our hearts together in worship. We come from all different places, all different circumstances, and this is our time to come together and lift up the name of Jesus. So you'll see your part on the screen and join in when you are prompted to. So hope nonetheless, hope despite, hope regardless, hope still. Hope where we have ceased to hope. Hope amid what threatens hope. Hope that defies expectations. Hope that makes a way when there is none. Hope that takes us past our fear. Hope that calls us into life. Hope that holds us beyond death. Hope that blesses those to come. Let's worship together.
This next hymn, Come Down Long Expected Jesus, is one that we've talked a lot about in the, the recent weeks about a hymn tune called Heifredal, which in the red hymnal is there seven times to seven different texts, and we all agreed that it's the hymn tune we should sing this great text to this morning. It's one of those quote-unquote sacred cows. If you want to read the music, which I always encourage you to do, it's in the green hymnal. We just have a mo we have Christmas colors in the pew for you this morning. It's in the green hymnal on page 168. You'll see there the words we're going to sing with the tune we're going to sing. I'm going to jazz it up a little bit with guitar. Let's worship the Lord together. <laughs> first Sunday of Advent, we come before you with songs of praises and prayers. We come with concerns. We come with anticipation what you will do in this Christmas season. We await all those special times that you will show us something new this particular Advent, having celebrated it many, many years before. We're just so grateful that you gave us Jesus, that he lives and reigns within us and in this space, and we pray in his mighty name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So during the Advent season, we like to feature lots of different voices that you may not see normally up here on the platform for our Advent readings each week. And so this morning we have Jake Fisher and Liv Soto to lead us in our first Advent reading as we look at the word hope. Our reading comes from 1 Corinthians 15, um, verses 12 through 20. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we have then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. For, if only, for only if this life we have hope in Christ, we are, all, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead and the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This morning on the first Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of hope. Hope is something that can be difficult to trust. We can easily chalk it up as wishful thinking. In fact, false hope leaves deep scars and sometimes we can't recover when we place our hope in something or someone that disappoints us. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul boldly presents hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ as a matter of historical fact. You can take it to the bank. He stakes everything on the truth that when Jesus came out of the tomb, everything changed. This Advent, we are reminded that the hope that begins in a manger ends in an empty tomb, offering all people the opportunity of redemption. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, you are hope. You are the living embodiment of all of our hopes. 
Through your faithful life and victory over death on the cross, we have a real hope that's not just wishful thinking. This Advent, remind us that you continue to bring hope as you pursue relationship with us each day. Amen. Amen. Good morning again. Good morning. All right. It's great to see everyone here today. Um, if you are visiting for the first time, there is a card in the pew we ask you to fill out and drop in the box at the back by the back door. Um, and as everyone else, if you could take the black book and pass it down your rows and let us know that you were here. Um, also, if you have any prayer requests, there's a card in the pews as well if you'd like to fill that out and drop it in the box at the back. Um, today, right after service, we're going to do it right here in the sanctuary. We ask you to stay for the annual budget and election meeting. Um, it will be... It won't be too long. Um, we ask you to stay because we'll be uh, voting on new board members um, as well as the budget. So please plan to stay for just a little bit after church. You don't even have to move. We're going to start right away. Uh, yesterday, the ladies' brunch um, was a huge success. What a nice, nice time. Um, I think most of the ladies sitting here were there, um, and I believe everyone had a nice time. I think there's a picture. Um, we remembered to capture the moment. Um, and hopefully that will be maybe a new tradition we start every Christmas time to kind of get our hearts ready for Advent. And then there is a sign-up sheet for the men's breakfast on the table. Um, those of you that would like to join the men's breakfast on the 16th, let's see if you guys can beat 38 people. It's not a competition. Who says? <laughs> All right. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's church time. All right. Um, a reminder of the Wednesday Bible study um, pursued at 1 o'clock and 6.30. Please, you do not have to come every week. If you can't make it, but you can make it this Wednesday, please come. Um, and then Pastor will talk a little bit more about Unwrap Christmas, but there is a sign-up sheet. We do need to know that you're coming, so we have kind of an accurate count um, who's going to be there for dinner and crafts. Also, Almost Home, we're doing a new collection this week or this month, we are collecting ramen cup of soup, okay, so the ramen cup of soup, not the packages, and then soup cans with pop tabs because, so that they don't need a can opener to open them. So there will be places to put those um, in the front of the church. Are there any other announcements? No? Okay. Now let us open our hearts and be Christ to everyone we meet. Um, let's welcome each other, welcome a stranger, welcome someone that you don't know very well today. As Christ welcome everyone, let's do the same. Please get up and share God's love and peace with each other. Lots of new, lots of faces that were here last oh, wow. Christmas. Lots of faces that were coming. then. Well, you're invited to find your seat once more as we continue to worship this morning. It's one of my favorite sights during Sunday morning is to see our church family connecting with one another. I was having a conversation with somebody this week, and they were talking about, they're new to our church, they were saying, you know, this is unique. Not every church greets like this and shares community like this. And I think it is 
a real special part of our church family. And so it, it does bring me a lot of joy, even if it takes a couple extra minutes to get everybody back to their seats. That's a good problem that I will take every day of the week and twice on Sunday. So it's good, good stuff. <laughs> Well, we're going to continue to worship uh, through our time of offering, and while we don't pass the plate anymore, this is the time when we, can, we ask you to consider how God might be calling you to invest and participate in his kingdom work. And Kelly mentioned unwrapping Christmas, and I want to mention it one more time, because I know that, you know, it's something that's a little bit new from what we've done in the past, and you might be wondering, like, is this going to be something that I'm going to enjoy? But like I talked about last week, this is something that we are intentionally inviting families from our preschool to participate in. And it's an opportunity for us to welcome those families into community, for them to experience the love of all of these church aunties and uncles and grandmas and grandpas. And we know, studies have shown us, the more uh, connections that a child has with a loving adult, someone who cares for them, someone who's cheering for them, someone who looks out for them, the more successful they will be. And we want to embody that here at Trinity. As we look to our future, as we look to bring back families into our congregation, we want to lean into what is the best aspect, I think, of Trinity Church, which is the community, the community life. So please do put your name on that list. Again, we're going to order food, I don't know, midweek this week, and we, we want to make sure that we've got enough for everyone, and we also want to make sure we've got enough if there's someone who wants to come at the last minute, that there's a place at the table for them as well. So something to, something to think about um, to, to make time for next week, I think it's going to be worth your investment of time, and uh, if you do call um, Trinity Home and you want to invest financially, we do have an offering box on the way out, or you can donate online at trinityecc.org, but this morning, Ron and I are just going to play sort of an instrumental version of Come, Thou Long Expected Jesus. And it's an opportunity for you to just ponder as we prepare for the message, as we prepare, prepare for what's next in the service, how is God calling you to participate in his kingdom work? Father God, this morning we do hold on to hope. Not wishful thinking, not fleeting thoughts of, I hope this will happen or I hope that will happen, but a conviction, God, that you are at work, that your Holy Spirit is present with us today and is active and is moving and invites us. And God, you are making all things new constantly through Jesus Christ. So, Lord, may our celebrations of Christmas not just be sentimental. May they not just be nostalgic, but may they be declarations of hope. Because our hope is in you, Lord. 
And we need that hope as we look at our world, as we look at the struggles, as we look at uh, things that our world is going through, people that are in poverty, people that are facing death, people that are facing unemployment, people that are facing challenging medical situations. God, we need your hope. We're dependent on it. And so, God, may we see you with fresh eyes. May this Advent not just be another ritual, not just another resuscitation of something we've done for years and years, but might we see you anew this time, this year. May you stoke the hope in our hearts. May we hold that candle of hope for others who cannot see it today. And God, if we, can, if we are having difficulty experiencing your hope, God, might you bring someone into our lives to hold us up. And God, we know that this work is not for the faint of heart. We know this work of being hope dealers is not easy, especially in so many challenging situations in our world. So we need you, Jesus. And we fix our eyes on you and we pray the prayer, Jesus, that you taught us to pray, which says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. So our theme that we introduced last week for Advent is pursued. That God pursues a relationship with us. That he, he did pursue us through Jesus and he continues to pursue us all the time. He's always seeking to deepen that relationship, to deepen that connection. And so each week of Advent, we focus on a different word. And again, we talked about at the beginning of the service that these are not just abstract words that we adorn our Christmas decorations with. But these are words that we need. These are words that carry us through all kinds of situations. So I want to invite you this morning to follow along with me through the scripture that Liv read a little bit earlier in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if you want to use your phone this morning, uh, there is a QR code on the back of your bulletin that will open up the YouVersion Bible app. And that will, let, that will take you to the outline of the sermon with the points. And so if you want to follow along on your phone, you can do that. Um, if you want to follow along with the scripture, I just encourage you, we're going to walk through as we typically do, verse by verse and phrase by phrase through the scripture. And so you're going to want to have some version of the Bible, whether it's a paper form or digital, in front of you this morning. And so this passage that I'm going to read this morning, that we're going to study this morning, you might say, this sounds more like an Easter sermon than a Christmas sermon or an Advent sermon. And that might be so, that might be a fair point. But unless we have that empty tomb, the manger, well, it's just a manger, just a baby. So we're going to start in verse 12 to get into the significance of why the Christ child had to come. And Paul begins in verse 12, he says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? You see, from the very beginning, the understanding, the belief, the truth, that Jesus bodily rose from the grave, that was the centerpiece of Christian belief, of Christian thought. That was a non-negotiable. It wasn't just that some of the followers of Jesus happened to see some spirit after Jesus was crucified, but no, Jesus physically, bodily came out of the tomb. And you actually see the description in verse 4 of chapter 15. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And it talks about the rest of the story, how he appeared to more and more people. And the belief was, this is the first time this had ever happened. It's the first time that God had 
moved in such a way to reverse the curse of Genesis. Reverse the curse of the Garden of Eden. That this body, it might die and it might go into a tomb or it might go whatever happens to it. But at some day, on the day of resurrection, that this body is reborn, is renewed. That we aren't just disembodied spirits flying around somewhere in the clouds, but that Jesus physically came out of the tomb and he was made new. And it's the first time this had happened. It's different from the Greek understanding. The people of Corinth that Paul was writing to, they came from a Greek background. And in that culture, well, maybe if you are a really exceptional person, when you died, you might go up into the stars. Your soul might do something significant. But there wasn't much hope because the gods were just far, far away. But not Jesus. In Jesus, God comes near to us. God comes close to us. God comes and moves into our neighborhoods. And when he comes out of that tomb victorious on the third day, the power of sin is broken. The power that in, of sin that infected all of creation way back at the beginning of the scriptures in Genesis 3, that, that that's broken and the power of death is defeated so that when we have a memorial service of someone who has died in Christ, we say we will see you again. That death is not the end. Death is, has been defeated. And that God restores us into eternity for those of us who believe in Christ, who trust in Christ. We have a real hope. That's what our hope is based on. Our hope is based on a historical reality. It's not just, well, that's a nice thought. It's a nice thought to think that I might have a chance at a death. That's, you know, we don't hope in Christ, the same way we say, well, I hope the Bears can get a win this week. Or, I hope the traffic's not that bad. Or I hope there's not a big line at my restaurant after, after church. That's a, well, I, I, a hope in that, man, wouldn't it be nice, but I'm not counting on it. When Jesus rose from the grave, we can count on it. We can trust our lives on it. That's why we have hope. And you might say, well, well, Tom, what's the big deal? I get it. There's a, you got a big cross up here, and there's a cross out in the, in the narthex this year by the Christmas tree, and I know that this is a Christian belief, but, but is it really that important, you might wonder? Let me say this. I have two objectives this morning with this message. If you believe in Jesus, if you put your trust in him, I hope this morning encourages you. I hope and it strengthens you. And if you're skeptical about the resurrection, my hope is after what you hear this morning, you'll say, I want to learn more. I want to see what all the fuss is about. So I, if, if, you, if you're sitting here with a skept, in a skeptical place, I don't want to say this isn't for you, because yes, it is for you too. But don't just say, well, I'm not in for this. Um, Forget about it. When's lunch? Hang in there. Because Paul says this is so important. Matter of fact, if you look at verse 13, he says that there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And it's true. If that cross is just a decoration of two beams screwed together or nailed together or fastened together, if that's all it is, a decoration or a piece of jewelry that you wear around your neck, if that cross didn't actually historically do something, then the manger is merely a historical footnote. Then Jesus is just another famous person that was born once and we remember their lives and they have some monument. Those monuments are scattered all over the world of significant people who have lived and died. But Jesus did something different. He rose from the grave. But if he didn't, if he didn't rise in the grave, then, then I'm just giving you a history lesson. This is just philosophy. 
More than that, he says in verse 15, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. Because if the resurrection isn't real, then I'm encouraging you to have a false hope. You could even say I'm lying to you. If the resurrection didn't happen, if Jesus didn't bodily come out of that tomb, then I am actively leading you astray this morning. You have gathered to hear me lead you astray if the resurrection is not real. There's a lot riding on this. And man, people put their hopes on all sorts of stuff, don't they? And I hope in this, I hope in that, and, and our experience is that when we put hope in something, it's more often than not, it's a 50-50 proposition. You know, whether it's a sports team or whether it's your retirement fund or whether it's whatever it is. It's like, well, I, you know, I hope so. But that's not what the Bible talks about hope. In Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about hope being confidence. It gives you a hall of fame of these faithful people. Confidence in what we hope for. It's not just like, well, it would be nice. It would be nice if there's life after death. It would be nice if Jesus rose from the grave. No. Either it's true or it's not. He continues in verse 16, For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. I think we're probably all aware that we all have broken pieces inside of us. We all have this infection of sin that we struggle with, that we wrestle with. We have things that we are working on. Paul talks about working out your faith in fear and trembling. That, yes, you might have said yes to Jesus at one point and trusted your life to Jesus, but the rest of your life is working it out. It's called sanctification. It's a big theological word, sanctification. And we're all in the process, and I, I know some people will say, you know, when I go to the TSA at the airport, I'm testing my sanctification because I, I'm well aware that I'm not quite there yet when I have to deal with those long lines or deal with the traffic jam. But we're well aware, aren't we? That we have struggles. We have challenges. We have obstacles. We have things that... We have been wrestling with, we have been working on for our lifetimes. And if the resurrection isn't real, we're hopeless. If the resurrection is not real, then the power of the Holy Spirit also is not real. And you have no hope of overcoming that. Because the only antidote to the infection of sin is Jesus. It's not my strength. It's not effort. It's not works. It's not good deeds. I think sometimes we fool ourselves into, um, I was, I was um, on a Zoom call with another covenant pastor this week, and he was citing a study that functionally Christians, or, or theoretically Christians believe that they are saved by grace. Theoretically, if you were to interview a, you know, a church after a service and say, do you believe that you're saved by God's grace? They'd say, yeah, I think I believe that. But practically, functionally, we have fooled ourselves into believing that our acceptance by God is dependent on what we do. That if I sin a little bit less than yesterday, if I do a, little, a few more good works than yesterday, if I volunteer my time just a little bit more, then God likes me more. Can I tell you that God likes you already? You don't do good deeds, good works, volunteer, give your tithe to the church. That's not to get brownie points with God. That's not the reason. We give of ourselves because we say, thank you, Jesus. I know what you did for me. What can I do for you? I'm not going to sit up here and guilt you and, and, and tell you that, you know, if you can, you know, put a few more dollars in the plate, then you get a, a better spot in heaven because that's not in the Bible. They tried to do that before the Reformation. They were called indulgences. It wasn't a good idea. That's where the Protestant Reformation came from to say, wait a minute, you can't buy your way into heaven. You can't buy a better seat in the kingdom of God. No, if the, 
We cannot on our own power counteract the power of sin and death. It is only through Jesus. It is only through the power of the resurrection that we have hope. So if it's not real, we're hopeless. Continues in verse 18. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we of all people most to be pitied. Yeah. If this is not real, what are you doing here? Well, I come to church to see my friends. Well, I come to church because it makes me feel nice. Well, I come to church because oh, I've been doing it this long. I might as well do it a, few, a little bit longer. No, if you are following Jesus without a real resurrection, then you're fooling yourself. We're all fooling ourselves. You're waste, we're wasting our time. I wasted a lot of time and money getting the education that I did and studying this Bible and preparing a sermon. If this isn't real, then I wasted a lot of time this week. Matter of fact, my job is pretty dumb if there is not a resurrection. Because again, I'm just peddling false hope and you know, superstition. But Christ, verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Let me say it again. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Man, I didn't get any amens on that. Nobody's excited about Christ raising from the dead. I think I need to find a new job, guys. This is, this is it. This is it. This is what it, let, me, let me try that again. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Amen. Okay. Well, I was getting ready to update my resume. Whew. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep means that Jesus is the prototype. He's the prototype of a resurrected person. He conquers death. He comes out of that tomb. His body is made new. If you think about when he meets with the disciples after he's resurrected, yes, he still has some marks, but he was mangled. Not mangled anymore. Jesus came to make all things new, to offer you the opportunity of a new life. So since Jesus actually historically rose from the dead, we have a real hope. And if you wrestle with that, you might say, well, you haven't given us any proof or any evidences. I'd love to talk to you about that. I'd love to talk to you about why I don't think you have to turn your brain off to believe in the concept of a resurrection. Right at the top of my head, if Jesus wasn't raised, then why didn't the Pharisees go grab his body out of the tomb, throw it on the middle of Main Street in Jerusalem and say, there he is. Will you guys just cut it out now? Never happened. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then why does Peter become a different person? After the resurrection. Why, why do the disciples go from these cowardly people running through the woods, afraid for their lives? Why do they go from fearful, meek people to preaching and 3,000 are added in a single day? That's only with Jesus. That's only through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is available to you too. Peter isn't just a superstar and man, I, I'm never going to be like him. No, Peter was just a guy who is available. So as we proceed on our Advent journey, I wonder, how does your faith give you hope? How does your faith give you real hope? And you might say, well, I'm working on it. I don't, I'm, not, it's not the, I'm not there yet. That's okay. Trinity is a place for you to come and learn, for, to come and investigate, to come and see what this book is all about. That's why we have Bible study every single week. Because this is not easy. And it's meant to be done in communities of people. So I don't ask that question to shame you. I don't ask that question to, to guilt you. I ask you that question to prod you. 
that Advent and Christmas could be a time to grow deeper in your faith, to go deeper in your conviction that Jesus is a, was a real person and is alive today and is still active. So how does your faith give you hope? And then how will this Advent season strengthen your hope in Christ? If you think about what you have filled your calendars up with in December from now until the 25th, are you taking time to grow your hope? Are you participating in activities? Are you, are you doing things that will help you expand your hopeful outlook rooted in Jesus? Because you should. You can spend a lot of time in the next 22 days doing a lot of activity and not have any more hope than when you started. But, but this is a, a golden opportunity for you to spend. Even, I would say this, even for me, going out and looking at Christmas lights with Amy in my car and listening to Christmas worship music, that is an experience of hope. It grows my heart. You might think, it's just lights, Tom, but it's just how you look at it. It's your intention. How do you approach your Christmas activities? Are you approaching them with a, a desire to grow in your faith? Or is it just, well, this is pretty. This is nice. Unwrapping Christmas next Sunday night. Again, I just keep beating this down. But you know what's really a good idea to do during the Christmas season? is Be around kids. If you want to grow your hope, be around kids. Because when kids hear about Jesus, their eyes get real big. Really? You should have seen how many preschool kids this week, when we had the, the manger and the cross, they were asking questions. What, Mama, what's that about? Dad, what's that about? Is that Jesus over there? Their eyes get big. They have lots of wonder. I think sometimes we forget that. We get so jaded and cynical because life has kind of beaten us down. But put yourself in positions to grow your hope. And then when you have it, or have some of it, how will you share it? Because hope isn't meant to be kept to yourself. Hope isn't meant to just hoard and gather and put in a big closet and you know stockpile and put in a warehouse. Hope is meant to be distributed and shared. I use the, the phrase hope dealer. Can you be a hope dealer during Advent? Hey, do you want some hope? I got some really good hope over here. You want some hope? That's who we should be. Take the opportunity. This morning we have music. We have a musical response. We're going to sing Christmas as its cradle. We're going to share in the Lord's Supper this morning. These are Christmas activities. Worship and participating in communion, these are Christmas activities. Just as much as hanging up stockings or stringing out Christmas lights. And as you participate, I invite you to participate with a posture of hopefulness that you might be able to share hope with the world. I encourage you to use your hymnal this morning and look at page 190 for this great song, Christmas Has Its Cradle.
shepherds came to see little son of Mary Lamb of God to be and his father warned him none would grant him room save in the Christmas cradle and in the Easter tomb Christmas has its cradle wise men came for a king. Myrrh alone stayed with him, death bound for this boy. From the Christmas cradle and to his Easter joy. Christmas has its cradle where the baby cried. In the they crucified when God's power was conquered God's light through him poured Christmas has its cradle and Easter has its Lord Christmas has its cradle and Easter has its Lord. It's all one story. I know it's separated by a lot of real estate on our calendars. But we can't get to the table without starting at the manger. So this morning we are going to prepare our hearts together. Our, our practice here at Trinity is to confess together our prayer of confession, and then we'll say a few lines or a prayer of confession, and then you'll have some time to reflect and take that time. May this, again, not just be a ritual that you participate in, but a preparation to experience God in a fresh way. And I want to just underline if this is your first time experiencing communion at Trinity, we practice open communion. If you love Jesus, if it's your desire to follow him, then you are welcome to participate. So would you join me in this prayer of confession? The words will be on the screen for you. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. So take a moment to reflect on how you have sinned against God and people. Where do you need a clean slate? in your life. So take some time to reflect before we continue. we continue together we have not loved you with our whole heart we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves so take a few more moments to reflect on how you have withheld love from God and from your neighbors how do you need God to expand your heart
we continue once more. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. So finally, take a few moments to reflect on how you represent Christ to others. What picture of Jesus do people get from what you say and from what you do? Now would you stand with me as we proclaim our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades, The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated once more. And we are reminded by the Apostle Paul as he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Holy Spirit, we pray that you would come and meet us today as we share in the bread, as we share in the cup, might we experience you in a fresh way, like we never have before. Might the truth of the resurrection, the symbols that this represents, God, may that resurrection provide us with an unshakable hope. Would you drill that hope down deep into our hearts that we might believe That we might live as hope dealers, as people full of your hope, that we might not keep it to ourselves, Lord, but we might share it with all those whom we come into contact with. Meet us at this table today. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. So we are going to, um, the deacons and I are going to serve you with the bread and the cup. I want to invite you to, to take it. And then to go back to your seats, hold it, and then we will all partake together. So come, for everything has been made ready.
welcome you in. I love the heart of Trinity. That's how we do it. And so, thanks so much for building your smile be good to us. Be a bottle of some wine. This is the body of Christ, broken for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Eat and remember what he's done for you. Now that my microphone's on. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. He was motioning at me. I said, what are you doing, Kyle? This is the blood of Christ. Poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink and remember what he's done for you. So we decided it might feel like a little bit of a, a gear shift. But hope should be celebrated. Christmas is a time to reflect, but it's also a time to celebrate. So we have kind of a festive song that we want to finish up with. It's got a festive tune. And so have fun. Christmas is also a time to have fun. I'd like to stand with us as we continue to worship this morning. Dancing is allowed. Amen. So is clapping. Down low, in the middle, or way up high. <laughs> the king is coming. Happy Advent. We can clap. It's legal. Yes. Yeah. So as we said before, uh, we are going to transition into our congregational meeting in just a moment. We have a lot to celebrate. We have a lot to be grateful for. God is moving. Whether you are a member or whether you are someone who's just checking Trinity out, you're welcome to stay and hang out. You can't vote if you're not a member, but you can listen. But as you go into this week, receive this benediction. May the Spirit of the Lord fill you with his hope. And may you not keep it to yourself. But may you spread it and share it with all that you meet. Go in God's power and peace. Amen.